Hello and welcome to Baseball Barbacast, the only baseball podcast in the world that will not make a trade with AJ Preller. I'm Jake Mintz. That's Jordan Schusterman, and everyone else will do it, yeah. but not these guys. No, no matter how many times AJ has called, he's tried to trade for me. He's tried to trade for yep. Jake. He's tried to trade for producer Andrew Hartz. He's he's he keeps asking, uh, but we we like our team. We like we our team. Look, I, I'm not going to be peer pressured into making a deal with AJ, especially not at the beginning of May. Exactly. And Jordan, none of us have children, and that means we cannot be Padres. On today's show, we will review and analyze the trade that happened over the weekend. Late on Friday night, Luis Arise, contact merchant, going from the Miami Marlins to the San Diego Padres for a horde of prospects, as is so often the case. When it comes to the Padres and AJ Preller, then we will recap the weekend, tell you everything you missed and everything you saw before wishing Willie Mays, the old 2-4, a very happy 93rd birthday. 93, man. That is wow. that is no joke. And, uh, and you so know what we, they say? Yeah. He could still go get it out there in center. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he's... Again, he stole a base in his final season. I think he could in this with these rules. I, I think ninety-three-year-old Willie Mays could could swipe a couple bags. <laughs> Very small Willie Mays take before we talk about fellow legend Luis Arise. Sure, Willie Mays, underrated. Oh yeah, not even not even underrated, close. underrated. Uh, all right, Jake, let's talk about a trade. A May trade. You know, I feel like a May trade is even more rare than like sometimes we get trades like first week of the season because there's an injury or like very late March. We've seen like Craig ones Kimbrell, like that. When Craig Kimbrell got traded, I think it was to the po- to the Red Sox or the Padres. I think that I trade mean, happened been, on like April 7th. He's been dealt, uh, dealt a few times. Um, but yes, uh, Craig Kimbrell, when he was first traded, nicely done. No, from, from the Braves to the Padres was on April 5th, 2015. That is a very specific memory. I'm, I'm very... Uh, Impressed there. He was, he was traded to the Dodgers. Sorry, I've been thinking a lot about Craig Kimbrell the last couple of days. He's as somebody who watches the Orioles. That's true. I saw I saw Craig Kimbrell uh, shut it down there uh, on, I know. Uh, on Friday. Anyway, all right. So, Luis Arise has been traded to the San Diego Padres. He's already collected five hits with the San Diego Padres, which is pretty amazing. Uh, but that's that's what he does. That's what Luis Arise does. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the Marlins and their uh, you know catastrophic start to their season on this show. We talked about Skip Schumacher. You've kind of written about it. You've talked to Skip. You've talked to Peter Bendix. You've kind of been around the Marlins. So before we get to this trade, why why why, why did this happen? Why did the Marlins do this? Because they stink. I I think you can fault Peter Bendix and Marlins ownership for not deciding to invest in the team for the season. But once they woke up on May 3rd and were 85 games at a first place, I have no issue with this decision in that context. Now, I do think that there's an argument about like, you need to give the fans something to watch, particularly in that market. Now, that might not apply to Miami, actually, because it's not like they're packing the place anyway. So. I understand that this could a full teardown could be very dangerous for them, but it's not as if they're like relying on ticket revenue to make this machine go. Luisa Rise does, however, represent the type of player that a fan base cares about, even when you're bad. And so from that perspective, I do feel for Marlins fans. However, I think Peter Bendix got this job because he was willing to tear it to the studs. That's why they hired him in the first place. This was never going to be a quick rebuild. They were never really going to try and contend with a roster that overperformed a year ago when they made the postseason. And so I think as unfortunate as this is, as the Arise trade kind of symbolizes, it feels somewhat inevitable to me, given how the season began. Totally. And I think that, right, when you zoom out and you understand the bigger picture of why Bendix was brought in and what he is trying to accomplish, which is just get this organization to a healthier place from a talent-based standpoint. And if you accept that they are clearly not going to be good this year and possibly not next year either, Luis Arise does not serve i mean he serves a purpose because he's an amazing player and an amazing teammate and an amazing presence and like all those things so like I, i'm not discounting that 
But for Peter Bendix's job, which is to, you know, ensure a, a healthier and better future for the Marlins, that that player does not bring a lot. It'd be one thing if Horizon was under contract for the next five years, right? And it's yeah. like, all right, you could have built around him. He's going to be a fan favorite. He's going to be here. He's through next season, and ultimately they they jumped at at a, at a pretty healthy healthy package of prospects, which I want to get to at the end of this because I want to focus this conversation on Arise the player and what the fascinating part of this, which is that the Padres are the ones targeting him, right? Because on one hand, duh, uh, the Padres are in a situation this year where anything that they can do or any opportunity they can they can to improve their major league team, even if it doesn't look like what they obviously need. They are going to do that because there is more pressure on them to restore a level of of competence and and competitiveness compared to last year than a, a lot of teams, right? And AJ Preller understands he's only going to get to have this leash for so long, and this was a chance. Clearly, a player that he he coveted and already tried to trade for earlier in the year, and he decided, listen, these prospects, I. They don't mean anything to the Padres right now. Of course, they could come back to bite us, but he's done this so many times before. If anyone's going to be comfortable ditching some of these guys for a player that doesn't necessarily fit on the roster, but we can talk about how he does, it's going to be Preller, and there's no surprise there. But I do think it makes them better. I think Luis Arias makes them a better baseball team. Because, I mean, duh. Like, y- yeah, he he yeah. hits 300 right, every right. year. Yeah, and <laughs> and at the same time, you, you see there they have a million infielders. But the, the the real thing, the, the timing of this that's important for those who haven't been following the Padres super closely is that Manny Machado, who was coming off offseason elbow surgery, had been playing DH for essentially all of April. And in the last week or so, he started to play third base every day uh, again, which means that the DH spot has opened up and they don't really have anybody to give those at-bats to. It's been, you know, Eggy Rosario. I know they just called up Donovan Solano so we could see him get some of that. I know they signed him late. But really, like, there there were at-bats to give. Now, Luis Arise is kind of a funny DH because, boy, does he hit. But he's not going to slug. He is the current active leader on the Why Haven't You Homered Yet leaderboard. But he's someone that makes your lineup better no matter what because he is a pain in the ass to pitch to. And you have other guys in, on, on the team that can hit it over the fence. And so you're just counting on him to... Do what he did on Saturday. Give you four hits, keep the line moving, have a bunch of long at bats, and just be a pest. And he can absolutely do that. I think it's worth looking at this trade within the uh, stress timeline of the San Diego Padres mm-hmm. of the urgency situation. AJ Preller has gotten such a long leash atop the San Diego Padres. And a lot of that was because he had a very close relationship with owner Peter Seidler. Now, Seidler unfortunately passed away over the winter. And there are more important impacts of that than what happens to the San Diego Padres. However, one result is that Preller's rabbi, Preller's advocate is no longer running the baseball team. And so it is much easier to envision Preller being fired or the Padres changing direction now that there are different people at the helm. Now, what does that mean in practice? Well, it means that the Padres need to make the playoffs this year. This year, yeah. right now. Yep. The 2024 Padres have to reach October, at least, in yes. order for A.J. Preller to feel comfortable about having this job a year from now. Mm-hmm. And so, prospects. A.J. Preller cannot worry about the 2026 and 2027 San Diego Padres. What does he care about that team if he's not around to run it? And so that is why we have seen Preller, who already was willing to part with prospects, turn that up to 11, okay, in the trades for Dylan Cease and this trade for Luis Arise. And it's worth noting that in the trade for Juan Soto, who did the Padres get back? Not really any prospects. It was almost all players who could help Pitchers. Big league team. Yeah, they needed to right fill innings, now. right? And that's and that's still yeah. a question with this team, right? And that's why when you know when they trade for Rise, it's like, well, they, they got another move in them because they the what's the problem with the Padres right now, and the reason why they're stuck around five hundred is because they can't stop runs and not necessarily you know score them. Now again, Arise still makes them better. He's an imperfect fit. You could say, oh well, he gives them more infield depth in the case that Hassan Kim leaves after this year, and that's and that's true. But this is about right now. There's a reason he's not waiting until July. And I'm sure he'll be making moves in July too. 
But this is the kind of aggression and the context of which Preller is, is clearly operating. Yeah. So that's the uh, that's the Arise trade. Uh, probably worth noting the Marlins are paying for all of the 2024 salary. Yeah. Jordan, do you want to talk about the prospects very briefly? Yeah. yeah very just, briefly, Jordan. Sure. No, that's Very fine. briefly. That's fine. No, I mean, I, and the, the last thing on Arise is like Arise is he is such a fascinating player. Like he is oh, yeah. a very divisive player because I think I go back and forth like every day between thinking he's underrated and overrated <laughs> because the, the truth is like you could love him so, 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 so much. And if he's slugging 350, he's slugging 350, you know, like that's that I'm sorry. And, and providing very little defense. Like, I'm sorry. I don't care how, uh, like, yes, he's an 80 hitter. He has one of the greatest hit tools we've seen in his generation. Like that is indisputable. There is a limit when you are not providing any power and you are not providing any defense. That is a fact. I'm sorry. Like, that's just the truth. At the same time, his bats of all skills in this generation are so amazing and so fun and are absolutely make him so lovable on top of what everyone, everybody says is that he is as incredible of an off the field presence as you can possibly have in terms of just likability and having him around. So I'm excited for him. Padres fans. I think he makes them better, but they paid a hefty price here. Okay. And again, when you think about the context of the Marlins was what does Luis Raz do for them? Well, okay, what do they get back? They get Wusako, who is a reliever who's just one of the best closers in the KBO over the last few years. The Padres gave him four and a half million dollars and he didn't make the team out of camp. So he's just been in double A. I'm sure we'll see him at some point in the big leagues this year. And that's someone, of course, you know, you'll have under under contract for at least a little bit. See what you have there. But the three hitters are the real key here. Because the real reason the Marlins are in this position is because they have not been able to develop a hitter whatsoever. The only way that they've been able to have hitters that have been helping them in the big leagues is trade for them. And so they're hoping that these three guys that they got, Jacob Marcy, Nathan Martorella, and Dylan Head, could eventually be that. Nathan Martorella and Jacob Marcy are guys you could more likely see in the near future. Both of these guys are in double A right now. Nathan Martorella, really strong first base bat, kind of OBP driven. Not as much power as you normally see from a first baseman, but a really polished hitter. I think we could see him at some point next year. Marcy was the MVP of the Arizona Fall League. He hasn't been as good in double A, but a really fun kind of speedy fourth outfielder type with good on base uh, skills. And then Dylan Head is, is the real one to watch here. He was a first round pick last year, 25th overall last season out of Chicago area high school. You know, 70 or 80 grade runner, outstanding center fielder, really good bats of all skills. You know, off to a slow start in A-ball, but he's, he's 19, and that's someone that, again, first-rounder not that long ago. And the Padres have traded away basically every first-rounder from their last decade, except for basically Jackson Merrill and, I guess, Robbie Snelling at this point. Everyone else is gone. Dylan Lesko. Um, Lesko, yes, Lesko is, is one of the few ones left. But, man, you pull up their first-rounders over the last 10 years, they are all gone, and now Dylan Head is the latest. Is that because they soured on him? No, it's really because Dylan Head is the kind of player that's going to take a while. And as we said... Padres, they don't have a while. They need it right now. And the, the Marlins uh, can kind of take the time to hopefully get better at developing hitters because that's the other part about this. They're still going to have to be better at that part, but I do like the players that they got. AJ Preller does not have time to make risotto or paella here. Just pop that burrito in the microwave, AJ. Yeah. That's what it's for. Yeah. One last point on the Marlins hitters. Of the 13 position players on their big league roster right now, only one of them was originally acquired, signed, drafted by the Marlins. And that's Nick Fortes, who <laughs> oh, hits wow, ninth, catch, right. who was a fourth round pick for them, catcher, yeah. in 2018. Yeah. Everyone else yep. was originally acquired by another organization. And guess what? That that trend is going to continue. Unless they start, I mean, we'll see. For the, I know they just drafted pitchers at the top, but like that trend is absolutely going to continue with Bendix coming in because that's what the Rays look like. You know, and they've been better at drafting and developing, but that's how it's going to have to work. But you're going to have to hit on them and uh, yep. we'll see. And, you know, listen, credit to Bendix. I, I honestly think like there are some GMs in his position that would you would never see them in public. They would just make all these moves and just hide because of how bad. And he's doing the opposite. And you you could not like what he says. And I totally get that. And like you can say that the bigger picture that this is bad for baseball and it's unfair to the fans. That's totally fair. But he's going in front of every microphone and he's telling you the point of this. And so at the very yeah. least, I appreciate and that. And that's what he was hired to do. Yeah. When he went in for his interview with Marlins owner Bruce Sherman, his pitch to Sherman was, your organization, even though you just made the playoffs, is not in a good spot. This is going to take some time. If Sherman wanted to be in the playoffs next season, he would not have hired Peter Bendix. Now, I do think that you're right. Maybe it's not the best thing for baseball to rip it up from the studs. And I think we're... The Orioles right now are an example of how it goes right, and the White Sox right now are an example of how it goes wrong. 
Okay. But I think that like faulting Bendix for it almost misses the, I think it's bigger than that. Yeah. It gets bigger than oh, him. Sure. And I, I do appreciate like he is willing to take the smoke. Yep. Like he is, 100%. he's been very honest and very forthright about why they're going about it the way they're going about it. Even if you mm-hmm. disagree with that, as I think I kind of do, I do respect yeah. how yeah. honest he's been. Jordan, enough transaction. Let's talk about actual baseball games. There it. were one, two, three, four and a half sweeps over the weekend. And we will begin with everyone's NLCS preview, <laughs> the Los Angeles Dodgers and the Atlanta Braves. The Bravos went out to Southern California for a showdown of baseball's two best teams. I think all ball knowers, most ball knowers, if asked, who is the best team in the baseball, would say either Atlanta or Los Angeles. Maybe some people would say the Orioles. Maybe some people would say the Phillies. I think those people are probably wrong. I believe these are the two best teams. But over the weekend, Jordan, over the weekend, there was only one king. The Los Angeles Dodgers sweeping the Braves, a close squeaker in game one on Friday before just kind of crushing them ass whooping on Saturday and yeah. Sunday. Yeah. If this is an LDS preview, I do hope we, we have more more games like game f- on Friday than on Saturday LCS. and Sunday. LCS. Uh, and LCS, preview. sorry. Uh, LCS preview, then I do hope it is a little bit more competitive. Yeah. I mean, the Dodgers offense over the last week or so has rounded into the like, oh, right, like this could be one of the greatest offenses we've ever seen. And we're going to talk about Otani specifically in a second. Freddie Freeman's having like his worst season in five years. And it doesn't matter. (laughs) They are because of what Muncie's been, because of what Will Smith's been doing. You know, Teoscar's got eight homers. This lineup is absurd. I know you want to kind of hit on some of the some of the Braves pitching, which we can here. But yeah, that, that was my takeaway from this weekend is when you see this Dodgers team rolling, they're going to get Bueller back tonight as well. They got the Marlins coming to town, probably tack on a few more wins here. Uh, I was, it was, it was stark. And, you know, I think the Braves, it was a situation where because the Braves, while their offense has also been amazing, they're not all clicking yet for all their stars either. And that well, was kind of part of the issue, but I, obviously the pitching was a bigger concern. Let's, focus in on a couple things. So the Dodgers offense looks amazing. However, James Outman has been terrible. Chris yeah. Taylor has stayed horrible. Kike Hernandez has been a little bit better, but is still pretty bad. And Gavin Lux has continued yeah. to struggle. Yes. That's like four players but, who we thought were integral to the bottom of the lineup where we're like, oh, they haven't gotten better. However, part of the reason that things have looked a lot better is Andy Pajes, who the rookie who had came up a couple weeks ago, I think he had the walk-off on Friday night, walk-off single, has been sensational for them. He has yet to walk. He has a 25% K rate. I think at some point that will come back to bite him in the butt a little bit, but he has just raked. He's got a 429 Babbitt, which is hilarious. But, um, but, but that's the he's thing. He's been about as good as you could ask. And he's still that kind of profile. If he's bad in seventh or eighth, like great. Fine. Like I, if you want, because honestly, like that's in some ways what Outman was kind of doing last year, you know, in terms of swing, like that's fine. That, that works because the top is just so good. It's so good and so exhausting to face these guys. And, um, Shohei Otani, uh, he's been the best hitter in baseball. So I know we were wondering, oh, what happens if he only focuses on hitting? Well, we're finding out. And he is leading in every possible offensive category. He, the underlying numbers are, are laughable. I mean, it is just absurd. His hard hit rates and x and all this stuff. And he's got 10 homers. He had a 460-foot home run. He is, it's all, the, the pitches that he's hitting out. I mean, Freed, it's like, he's like, what the hell am I supposed to <laughs> throw this guy? Well, <laughs> Freed, yeah. yes, he the first, the home run he hit off Freed was a backup curveball. The home, yeah, but some play. of the hits, the other hits that he, you know, the four hit game was just like, how, what are you supposed to do? It's like, all right, sure. You want to walk him? Like, I mean, it's not like the guys behind him stink. Right. But I think the biggest difference between these two teams over this past series that kind of came to the four is the difference in the pitching depth, right? The Dodgers have had so many guys on the IL. They have a full rotation worth of hurlers that are hurt right now including Kyle Hurt, which is just funny, but Clayton Kershaw, Walker Bueller, who will be back tonight. Tonight, yep. Right? Yep. Uh, Emmett Sheehan, Dustin May, 
Mm-hmm. Who else? Gonsolin. Bobby Miller, Tony Gonsolin. That's a whole rotation <laughs> worth of guys. Okay. Yep. And they have had Gavin Stone was very good on Friday. James Paxton was very good on Sunday. Walker Bueller was predictably great on Saturday. They have been able to fill in those gaps because of the pitching depth. Atlanta does not really have that. And losing Spencer Strider feels like a really difficult thing to overcome. Freaking duh. But what this series elucidated for me was what does the playoff rotation look like in Atlanta? When you see two teams that are definitely going to be in the playoffs play one another and you think about who the starting pitchers are and you think to yourself, is Bryce Elder really going to have to start a playoff game? And the answer is maybe. And like we saw how that went last year. And I, Max Fried doesn't totally look right. I know he's been better recently. Charlie Morton is one of the best 40-year-old pitchers, not on steroids that I've ever seen. And that deserves credit, but he's still on 40 years old. And so... I think that it is fair for the Braves to say, well, we lost Strider. That stinks. But meanwhile, the Dodgers have keep lost. Keep on coming. Keep they, on they, coming. The whole, so, the whole rotation. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I don't know if that's going to bite Atlanta in the butt during the regular season, mm-hmm. but it made me worry about them come October. I agree. The one name you didn't mention, which it feels unfair to say, oh, he's bailed them out because what a signing and what a, you know, sign of foresight. Reynaldo Lopez has been spectacular. And like, if he's this good, you know, you're in better shape. If he's your three, three or your four, you don't have to worry about Elder. But that's still one that like, we got to see him five starts. He's looked great. Again, we haven't seen him have a 30 starts of major league success as a starter before. So we'll see how that goes. But Dodgers, uh, it was it was a it was a resounding statement. Let's go from here to the Phillies, because I sure. think this is the most vulnerable the Braves have looked in the NL East for a number of years. And I think that I would still take them to win the division, but the the Phillies have gotten off to their best start under this current group. They took all three games from the Giants over the weekend. They played the Giants one more time today on Monday. But the big news here is that Trey Turner is hurt. He's going to miss six weeks about with a left hamstring strain. In his stead, Edmundo Sosa is going to play every day at short. They want to keep Bryson Stott at second. If Stott moves over to short for a little bit, Whit Merrifield might see some time at the Keystone at second base as well. It's an interesting situation for the Phillies because they've won, I believe, 16 of their last 19, but have played a relatively easy schedule in the process. And so it's very fair for them to feel good and be optimistic about maybe besting the Braves in the division. But there are some reasons to be skeptical about that over the long haul. Turner's injury now being another one. Yeah. Uh, Alec Bohm is hitting 464 over his last 18 games. I believe he has an 18 game hitting streak. I mean, that's what's going to be key here is because it was nice to see Harper get a homer. They need some of those. Now, Turner's been one of their best players, right? Besides Bone. He's been their second best yeah. hitter. Yeah. And so they're going to need kind of the rest of those those veterans who are making a lot of money to start hitting. And we've started to see signs of that. Stott has certainly heated up, which has been nice to see. Defensively, uh, we'll see what this seems like. Yeah, we'll, we'll probably see Sosa uh, at short and then maybe yeah. maybe some Stott. The- but it's just going to be about filling in, in, that, in that offense, I would say. And the reason the Phillies are where they are, two and a half games up in the division, is because the pitching has been so good. Yeah, it's the best. It stayed the best. sensational. Yep. And they've been the best starting pitching mm-hmm. in the league. The bullpen started to come around a little bit and had a better week. Yep. Um, I I don't know how much better this Phillies team is than last year's Phillies team, or they've just had a good run of schedule at the beginning of the year. I, yep. I want to wait a little bit longer to be like, they can win the division. Mm-hmm. Even though they're two and a half up, I still think the Braves are the favorite. Giants... Just hey, not, I, don't, I don't know, man. The, yeah. The big problem right now, big problem with them right now, I don't want to linger on them too long, is both of their catchers are hurt. Yeah. So like Patrick Bailey, who's super important to them, is out and Tom Murphy is out. And that put Blake Sable into duty last night, and he just did not look comfortable catching Logan Webb. And for a team that needs to be so good on the margins with everything, losing both catchers at the same time is really not a good thing. Next series, Orioles-Reds. You were there on Friday night. Tell me about it. Yeah, 
Uh, I was there, I was sitting in, in the press box, uh, enjoying Cole Irvin's dominance when I opened my first Luis Arises on the Padres now. Uh, yeah, so the Orioles are, are in great shape. Uh, you kind of wrote about this in, in your weekend, weekend recap, but the concern with the Orioles a week ago with the Kimbrel blown saves and some of the starting pitching up and down, I was like, oh, what's going on? Bradish looked amazing in his return. Cole Irvin continues to dominate. John Means was spectacular on Saturday. Now, they caught a Reds team at the right time. Reds on an L5, they get swept here. Their batting average is now down to 30th in baseball. They're hitting 210 as a team. The Reds' offense is very capable of just taking a nap. But really, you're feeling, you're really starting to feel the combination of the absences of McLean, of Friedel, of Marte, and then the fact that the veterans like Candelario have not quite had that same spark. So Ellie's doing all he can, but this Reds offense is capable of being very, very, very vulnerable. And the Orioles took advantage. And to see, to see again, some of the guys with, with the question marks about this rotation, right? Irvin means and Kramer for all three of them to just carve this weekend was credit to them. All no none of, they allowed zero runs. They allowed one run as a team on the weekend and the offense showed up because, you know, Santander kind of heating up, Everyone, everyone was going to kind of get into the mix. I was there for O'Hearn's, you know, Homer on Friday. They're they're just clicking, and you know, there's there's a million things you say about the Orioles. If you want to say they're the best team or the second best team in the league, I think you absolutely can. And yeah, they're the, they're they're chilling. Do the Orioles have too many good starting pitchers? Seems uh, like a problem. Go, Seems like an issue. <laughs> wouldn't go that far. I still uh, have some questions about their bullpen, but uh, yeah. but you know, I would say, but at the same time. I uh, yeah, they 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 look great and and they really they really took advantage of, of Cincinnati there. One quick point, one quick thing about the Orioles. A year ago, Ryan O'Hearn was a revelation who came up, uh, did not make the team out of camp. Okay, uh-huh. I believe was called up and then proceeded to just hit in the middle of Baltimore's order all year, and it was like, wow, that's amazing. How real is it? Here's how real it is. More Ryan real. O'Hearn has <laughs> taken it to a whole other level. He is second in baseball in expected WOBA and ex-WOBA, which is essentially weighted on base, taking into account your batted ball stuff, right? He is second behind Shohei Otani. Like, why is that the case? Last year, he was really good. He was hitting the ball really hard. However, his plate discipline and his swing decisions were not particularly good. They put him into the Orioles cheating lab, and he has gone from... A second percentile walk rate, Jordan, to a 71st percentile walk rate. Yes. And now he is in the 100th percentile for X Boba and expected slug, 99th for expected batting average. His K rate is the 99th percentile in baseball. Ryan O'Hearn is like legitimately one of the best. Yeah. Now, okay, to be clear, he doesn't hit against lefties. Literally doesn't, right? He has had five plate appearances against lefties and he's 0 for 5. But it doesn't matter because we've seen this with teams like Tampa Bay. Like, if you can basically get a player, and just we can roll our eyes at the platoons and say, oh, this is an interesting. Listen, it's hard. It's hard to argue with the results. If you could find players that can execute to this degree. I mean, my God. I mean, it's, again, it's, it's misleading to say righties. he's the second best hitter in baseball. And yes, exactly. That's why you can get away with it. But so he's doing everything you could possibly hope for. And uh, it's 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 just spectacular. When I saw him the other day in Baltimore, I said, how you doing? He goes, I'm hitting third for the best offense in baseball. Life's pretty good. And I said, hell yeah, Ryan O'Hearn. <laughs> yeah, so I, I saw his home run Friday. He is pretty good. All right, let's move on to uh, two other sweeps before we take a break. The Yankees over the Tigers. This one uh, got a little got a little wet on Sunday, I understand. It's a little, little sloppy, but hey, guess what? Juan Soto, this Juan Soto fella. Uh, how about this stat from Joel Sherman? I appreciated this one. Can you read it in Joel Sherman's voice? <laughs> Do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> no. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Joel Sherman gave this stat in his. Uh, I in love his other thing a stat. T- no, go ahead. <laughs> he uh, Juan Soto has come up with runners in scoring position on left in left on left situations ten times this year. He's five for seven with two walks, no strikeouts, a sack fly, and ten RBIs. That is. I think when we talk about, oh, situational hitting, that guy, he knows how to get the job done. Oh, my team sucks because they just strike out when it's like, that's all true. Like, that is kind of all accurate when you watch teams that struggle with running the scoring position. Is sometimes, sometimes is it luck? Sometimes is it, you know, 
just like a unfortunate sequence of of bad bad balls whatever but when you see someone deliver like this to this degree and it is Juan Soto you're reminded like oh yeah like that's the point this dude is such we talked about the, the comparison with him and so and judge right because as amazing as judge is he can look bad Juan Soto <laughs> he doesn't have bad at bats it doesn't exist it's a classic click case of he has that dog in him you know oh, we've talked about God. clutch I think five percent of hitters are cowards who fold in the clutch. I think 90% of hitters are the same. They're doing their best and sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. And then I think 5% of them are just beasts with slow heartbeats Uh, who are amazing. David Ortiz is this, Wad Soto is this, you know? And so I, I love this stat because it confirms what it looks like. Oh yeah. Right. He had the bases clearing double on Sunday to give the Yankees the win. Uh, it was in the eighth inning off Andrew Chafin. Uh, the offense otherwise was fine over the weekend. Aaron Judge had his first career ejection, which Congrats. is hilarious. Jordan. Mazel tov to Aaron. Jordan, speaking of captains, do you know how many times Derek Jeter was ejected as a Yankee? Oh, wow. I'm going to guess like two. Lower. <laughs> Zero? <laughs> Zero. <laughs> the captain <laughs> was never ejected. Okay. Is that true? I believe that is that true. That is yeah. why Producer Andrew Hartz, please double check that. Honestly disappointing. I saw that the judge is like the first Yankees captain to be ejected oh since my. Don Mattingly. Oh my God. So maybe Jeter was ejected before he was officially the captain. God. But I thought Jeter was just born the captain. You know, Yankees fan Hartz uh, confirms in the chat that yeah. Jeter was never ejected or as captain. Maybe not. I That is amazing. Aaron Judge didn't like a strike call. And he was like, uh, you've been BS all game. And then that was that was it for him. So. And then he came back the next day and homered immediately. So, yep, no that's problems. Captain One behavior. quick, two more quick things. Yankees bullpen was really good in this series, nine and two thirds yep. scoreless. I know Ian Hamilton did blow the save on Sunday, but still pretty good for a bullpen that had some question marks. And then the Tigers, like as bad as this sweep loss was for them, Riley Green oh, has he's, looked amazing. He's doing. For them. He's doing. And that is important. Because when we talked about like the Royals versus the Tigers and the Royals had Bobby Witt, who is better than anybody on the Tigers could ever be, Riley Green is not going to be as good as Bobby Witt. Like that's a fact. But if Riley Green keeps hitting like this, that is an all-star. That is a no doubt all-star hitter. And the Tigers need that because Spencer Torkelson is sure as heck not going to be that guy. So for to see Riley Green take that step forward would be really important for the here's Tigers. Here's a here's a good way to say how good Riley Green's been. He's been good enough to where the Tigers might get two All Stars, right? Like Scooble is going to be an All Star. He's awesome. He had twelve strikeouts. I know they like he's he's outstanding. He will be an All Star. Some of their relievers might be All Stars too. Riley Green, I mean he's he's just been one of the best hitters in baseball. So yeah, they they need that. They absolutely need that. Rest of the lineup. Uh, <laughs> all, all right, right one, on. more, <laughs> one more moving on come series. on we gotta we wait this long to get to this i'm wearing my my Ray city connect hat now i'm wearing the purple one that i don't think they'll be wearing on field at any point i bought this one because it has our beloved stale fish uh skating ray on the side but while the 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 stale fish was not on the hats that they were did, wearing this weekend sorry did you see Someone on Twitter called the that logo Evan Longboardia. <laughs> yes. yes, there's some uh, everything about it. I mean, boy, did it look good. And I think the skating Ray has has saved the Rays season. Yeah. It has saved Randy Rosarena, who <laughs> heated up over the weekend in spectacular fashion. Monster homer on Friday. Homer of Edwin Diaz down to his last strike on Sunday. They sweep the Mets. The vibes are tremendous in the Trump. I should wear these jerseys every single game for the rest of the season. Wear them at home. Wear them on the road. Wear them on the road. I don't care where you are. Whoever's the Rays all-star is, you should wear them in the all-star game. We love these so much. Sleep in your uniform like a Little League kid. (laughs) And they, and they, uh, they needed this. They really, really, really needed this. And while the Mets have been just ridiculously hot and cold, the Mets are not a bad team. So this is a very... This was a very important series for both of these teams because we've been like, ah, like in both directions. We're like, ah, ah, and then this is like the Rays. Like, okay, like they they really showed something this weekend. And it's again, the standard that they've set is, is why they've not like they've fallen that far behind. They're 17 and 18. 
But by their standard and in the AL East, we've been like, oh, no, disaster. Well, also last year they started the season 85 and 0 or whatever <laughs> the heck. True. And so it just That's true. That's felt very point. different. Yep. Two other quick things from this. Kevin Cash passes Joe Madden top spot on Ray's managerial wins list. That is appropriate. OK, that's it. I am a Kevin Cash believer. Yes. I think as a manager, he is. And I mean, this is a compliment. <laughs> the greatest system quarterback of all time. <laughs> I think that if you put him in a different organization, it wouldn't be the same. Uh, if uh, you put someone else in Kevin Cash's yeah. shoes in Tampa, it also wouldn't be the same. I think he deserves a lot of credit for what they've built there. So hats wow. off to Kevin Cash. And I mean, he's the longest tenured manager in baseball by a lot. Uh, he's been there. 2015 was his first season. And that's not an accident. So uh, credit to Kevin Cash. He definitely uh, fits in perfect there. Mets, really bad, tough losses there. But Christian Scott called up. That is, let's just wait till his next start. We'll talk more about him specifically when we get there. That is the kind of performance that when we're looking at the Mets and we're looking at all these old pitchers and we're saying like, really, this is the staff. If Christian Scott joins this group, now we can start to have a conversation. Obviously, there are other issues with the Mets. I believe it was six uh, innings. Six innings, one run in his MLB debut on Saturday. All right. Sure. Take a break. Sure. Let us take a break. And when we return, we'll run through the rest of the series from the weekend. Uh, We'll be right back on Baseball Barbercast. And welcome back to Baseball Barbercast. Jake Mintz, Jordan Schusterman. Look, so we watch a lot of baseball. We don't watch every series. Okay. We try and understand them all so we can tell you what happened. Uh, Guardians over Angels. uh, I watched like none of this. Yep. And I'll admit it, I'm sorry. I'm a, I'm an embarrassment. Yep. I do know that Jose Ramirez uh, hit a clutch home run on Sunday after a 10-pitch at-bat. He's good. The Guardians have been very good without him really turning it on. So if Jose Ramirez can get moving, that's huge for Cleveland. Yeah. Uh, the Angels really stink. Yep. Jose Cir- uh, Soriano has been great for them. Yes. That's like the one bright spot for the yes. Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Uh, and Stephen Kwan is going on the IL, which is bad for Cleveland. Anything is, else from this yeah, series? Yeah, bad for Cleveland, but Kyle Manzardo, uh, one of their top prospects coming up. Some people thought he should have made the team out of camp, so excited to see what he can kind of bring to that Cleveland offense. That is Cleveland over the Angels. Let's uh, do some other random. Let's go in a random order. How about, let's do the ones that we really didn't watch much of. I watched a little bit of this one. Rangers over Royals. This is a good response uh, kind of series for, for Texas. They've kind of been floating around the top of the AL West, having some pitching issues. Their offense, you know, Corey Seager, we talked about on Friday, really has been been scuffling lately. White Langford is now hurt. He'll be out for a bit. But getting this series here was was real a really impressive win on Sunday in particular. Uh, I thought that was a really good, good series win for Texas in Kansas City. Texas's strategy of make sure their biggest rival, the Houston Astros, Make sure they suck. Yes. While you scuffle slightly out of the gate. Yeah. I mean, that's genius. And and here's maybe the, the best way to sum up the series. Imagine before the season, if the, we were talking in May, like, that's a really impressive series win for Texas, the defending World Series champs, to go into Kansas City and take and take two. But the, I'm, I mean, I'm saying that with the, with a straight face. Like, that's, that's actually how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, where, where do you want to go next? Uh, A's over Marlins. In mm. a World Series preview, Oakland <laughs> scratches to 500. Okay, they're, I believe they're 18 and 18 after winning on Saturday. They scored 20 runs on Dude. Saturday. Rooker, Brett Harris, first two career hits are homers. The A's just blasting balls all over the place. And that was, of course, the day after they traded a rise. Uh, the Marlins looked toast. But they come back on, on Sunday and respond to avoid getting swept in Oakland. So good for the Marlins there. But uh, but yeah, Oakland man, they're they're a, they're a I mean, where are they the same? Again, they are they are seventeen and eighteen. They have the same record as Tampa Bay, better record than the Reds, Mets, Blue Jays, Cardinals, D backs. They have played some teams. Astros. I mean, they beat, the, they beat the Orioles in a series. They split with the Yankees. Like the A's. You said this coming into the year. You were right, dude. They don't suck. They do not suck. They are a fun. Speaking of of not sucking, let's talk about the Washington Nationals, who are at five hundred. Don't suck. They are the only team currently at exactly five hundred, at seventeen and seventeen. The run differential is still in the negatives, but guess what? This offense kind of bops. And no, e- don't I- trick yourself <laughs> into that. They're they're all right. The I mean, Blue Jays pitching stinks. The Blue Jays pitching. This is a this is talk about panic meter. I think Toronto. Can we is kill now off a top. team? 
I'll kill the oh, mouse. Wow. All right. I, well, I, I'm not sure I would go off? that far. But it's a little early, but I'm I'm like feeling it. Like Blue I'm Jays ready pitching to just... currently 30th in pitching F war after just a catastrophe over the weekend. Alec Manoa get knocked around as his first in his first start of the year. But guess what? I can't get like, yes, that's not good. But like Alec Manoa is not the problem right now. Like they're just finding ways to lose all over the place. The off, they, they, they lost the game in which Vlad Jr. hit a grand slam. If Vlad Jr. is going to hit a monster grand slam, we got to win that one, boys. We got to we got to take care of business in that one. But instead, Jesse Winker and Luis Garcia and Eddie Rosario were like, bop, bop, bop. Watch out. Here come the Nats. Uh, Nats so, taking the series uh, over Toronto. Toronto has a stretch now at Philly. Just for, for like two, two right? Which yeah. I hate. Yeah. Three against the Sausage Kings up in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Three at Baltimore. Okay. Oh, boy. Okay, maybe we can bury Three them. against the race. And then they get the White Sox, which is always great. But in Toronto, call me in a it, like after they play the Orioles series next Wednesday, and I think I will be ready to bury this team. I am I don't feel great about it. I know I sound really happy to kill off the Toronto Blue Jays. I'm not. It's unfortunate. It bums but me dude, out, man. Like it bums we- me out. Vlad mid this year, Kevin Biggio, not good. Bichette. Alejandro Kirk, Bichette. not Disaster. good. Bichette, what are we doing? Horrible. IKF, exactly what they expected, but that's not spectacular. David Schneider rules. Kevin Kiermeyer fall off an offensive cliff. George Springer smells washed. Ugh. Dalton Ver- Varsho, Ernie Clement, and Danny Jansen are carrying this lineup right now. That's great for them. <laughs> yeah, and Turner. But I am. And Turner. Yeah. And Turner. Oh, yeah. Justin Turner is somehow like, what a thing. He's but I am. I am officially worried about the yeah, Toronto Blue Jays. If you made me just pick where they are going to finish this year, I would say fifth. I would I would change that. I would put them behind Boston. Yeah, uh, there's well, still a lot of time left. Like they're they're 16 and 19, right? right? Like they're three games under 500. Right. It's probably too early. They've played worse than that. I'm worried about Toronto. Yeah, uh, minus 37 run differential is I think bottom five or six in the league. And yeah, the contrast between you know the weekend the Tampa Bay had, not feeling awesome about that. You know what We're, they need. Yeah. Their city connects aren't out yet. Oh, man, that's true. That's an opportunity. That's an opportunity, Toronto. Don't don't waste it. I know they've already been designed and you already know what they are, but let's make sure that those are those are good because uh, we need anything we can get at this point. You need a skateboard on there. <laughs> Skate culture. <laughs> the race had What's an amazing skate culture in Toronto. The race, the race had an incredible tweet about the intrinsic link between baseball and skate oh. culture. Is so good. Anyway, all right, where are we going next? If if the Blue Jays like pre-planned these uniforms to be Drake related, they're in for a <laughs> oh no, a tough sell. <laughs> Great point. All right, what's where? What series do we want to do next? Uh, let's do Pirates over Rockies. The Pirates offense is not good. I've never watched a lot of a series that a team won and left feeling worse about them. Like the Pirates offense is just terrible right now. Again, they won two out of three because the Rockies are worse. Colorado is worse than Pittsburgh, definitely. And Pittsburgh has something that no other team in baseball has, and that's Jared Jones. On Saturday, sensational again, seven innings, uh, no runs, one hit. Like he is one of the best pitchers in baseball already when he's cooking. Uh, however, yikes, 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 yikes. This offense stinks. I know they scored five runs on Sunday, but wow, five, r- five whole runs. Well, that's what oh. was great. I think <laughs> there was like a, a headline on like pirates.com or like MLB.com that was like, uh, oh, here we go. Something had to change. Bats break out in series <laughs> finale win. Break they, out. I don't know. If okay. Five runs is they, a breakout. They that's beat- like one pimple. They beat the Phillies 9-2 to two on April 14th. Since then, they had scored more than four runs one time before Sunday. I that's, guess breakouts are relative. Oh, my God. Anyway, so that's the Pirates. But, hey, guess what? More importantly, Paul Skeens, I believe, will be – again, this is not sourced. I'm just saying. I think he will be making his debut this weekend. Saturday? Uh, fr- could be Friday. Could be Saturday. Cubs coming to Pittsburgh this weekend. He made a start on Sunday in Indianapolis. First start of the year on regular MLB rest, four days rest. He only made 66, only 66 pitches. When he got pulled in the middle of the fifth inning, he was like actively laughing. 
Like he basically looked as again, it's like, think about what this guy was doing last year where it's like six innings automatic, seven innings automatic. He's going 120 pitches every time. And here he comes. Here comes this AAA manager slowing him down after getting one out in the fifth inning. And he's like cracking up. He's like, all right, dude, I am in generously interpreting this as, all right, bro, you did it. You here. That's the end of your AAA career. And I hope he'll be coming up this weekend. If not soon, my gosh. Anyway, Paul Skeens will be up soon. Him and Jerry Jones will be a delight. Who's Mi- the manager? Miguel Miguel Perez. Uh, I don't know a ton about him. Um, but Thoughts was, and prayers to Miguel I, Perez. I just again like it, <laughs> if you have MILB TV, I encourage going back and watching okay. it because it was it was so funny and like it was the least obvious thing uh, or the most obvious thing ever. It's as to what Skeens was thinking. But uh, Colorado Rockies, give us a reason to talk about you, not laugh about you. Uh, they suck. So uh, much. Cubs Brewers, a the first showdown of the year between Craig Council and Craig Council's former team. This one was in Chicago, so it was not as spicy. Like when Mm, the Cubs head back up to Milwaukee and that fan base gets to cheer and boo Craig Council, that'll be fascinating. End of of this month. We'll see that. End end of of this this month. month. That'll be much more interesting. This was still interesting because I think these are the two best teams in this division. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that a little bit more later. Um, Cubs lose the first one, win game two and game three. Imanaga didn't even throw in this series, and they somehow won it. Yeah. Yeah, that was impressive. And, you know, Nico Horner, first homer of the season. Good to see that. Morrell has been on fire recently. He is when he's when he's getting a hold of them. I mean, that, as far as just aesthetic home run hitters, Christopher Morrell is is very high up there. And I mean, you mentioned Noah Minaga, but Javier Assad keeps on keeps on trucking. And Tyon has looked awesome. That's an even bigger deal for them, I would say, considering how terrible he was for the first half of last year. The Brewers are good, though. I think we as a community need to appreciate Willie Adamas more. Yeah. And so I plan on rectifying that. And uh, right. In the pending free agent, right? I mean, he's that's a guy we could look up at the end of the season and be like, oh boy, this guy's about to get super duper paid. So he is not Boris. Mm, no, he is not. C A Aka Sports. <laughs> the Colonial Association of America <laughs> Academic Athletic Association. Let's uh let's stay in the NL Central and talk about what happened to the Cardinals over the weekend. Jordan Schusterman, you picked the Cardinals to win this division. Every other week, I have given you an opportunity to jump ship yeah. on that selection. Yeah. Are yeah. you ready to jump I, ship on the yeah. 2024 St. Louis Cardinals? I am. I you am. are? I am. Wow. Why? What changed? The, White Sox, had, the White Sox had The White Sox had <laughs> one road win before this weekend, and they left with three. Wait, this series was in St. Louis? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, the Rays getting swept oh. on the south side is one thing, but um, this was embarrassing. This was just an yeah. atrocious performance across the board. Their offense is a joke. I, uh, yeah, it sucks. I don't feel bad about my pick because the way that they've been bad is not, I think, what anybody necessarily expected. The pitching, the old pitchers are, they're fine. Like they're <laughs> Sonny Gray is outstanding. Like they're they're in, like th- that's not the problem. Their offense is is atrocious, and the injuries have sunk them. And Walker's in AAA, and Gorman's not doing anything, and Goldschmidt is awful. And it's like all like that's anyway. So maybe I overrated the. I definitely overrated the infrastructure because the infrastructure might be the problem at this point. When you kind of look at how they're treating these issues. But um, yeah, Bernie Miklas in St. Louis, who certainly <laughs> I, one of my favorite baseball things is like when a team has a terrible weekend and someone who's like around the team or has followed the team for a long time, just like unleashes a string of like this team is a joke tweets. And and Bernie Miklas brought some heat. <laughs> I encourage people checking out. Uh, so good for the White Sox, I guess. You know, that's a good, good, nice little morale boost. But yeah. Can I read these word for word? That just yeah, seems like a fun time. Please. Through Friday, the White Sox were 1-14 on the road and has lost nine straight away from home. Before leaving town, the White Sox won two games in a row, won their first road series of 24, and left a carcass of a team behind in St. Louis. The Cardinals franchise was in a bad spot when DeWitt bought it. He did a great job of putting together a successful operation for one of the greatest eras of Cardinals baseball. That's key in any of these tweets is you have to like give credit where credit's due, and he does do that. But franchise leadership... Let the system and product get stale. Now it's rotting. Stale, not stale Set. fish. Stale fish is good. Stale, stale bad. <laughs> and now it's rotting. Sad. 
The sad at the end is so Trumpian. Mm. It's... One more tweet. State of the Cardinals. A lot of money invested in aging talent. Young next generation stars with derails in development. Signing old dudes to sit on bench. Not the bench, but sit on bench. is It hits better. Marketing, branding, all about former legends. Still milking the past. The feel-good pill isn't working anymore. Booyah, baby. I mean... Hashtag feel the burn from Whoa. Bernie Miklas. <laughs> anyway. Let it eat. No further comment, Your Honor. Let's move on. We have two, uh, three more series. Let's, uh, I want to finish with the Mariners. So let's do Padres over Diamondbacks quickly. Um, Arizona also slipping. And I was, if they got swept on Sunday, I was ready to put them in the panic level. And they're coming to Cincinnati this week. So I'm excited to kind of be around them for a couple of games. You know, Corbin K, they, they beat Matt, Matt Waldron, the knuckleballer on Sunday, but they, they you know, still lose a series at home. Their offense is still trying to find itself. So them against Cincinnati here with Cincinnati scuffling, this is a big, big opportunity, you know, concern for both teams here who really need in this kind of middle, messy middle of the National League. This is a pretty important three game series for, for Arizona and Cincinnati coming up this week. Corbin Carroll hit a ball 109.2, though. So did he really? For a single yesterday. That's fine. That's that still is. I love to hear that. That that fires me up. I would love to see Corbin Carroll hit one 109 over the fence uh, this week. That would be nice. That's what we prefer. So maybe he will do that uh, in Cincinnati. We will we will see. And then San Diego again, like the rise head for it's in his debut. I, I uh, Tatis had the amazing play where he got a ball in right field on a single and then basically back picked the runner at first base, which is something you can do in MVP video games four. but yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can do that it's very very much like you see in video games all the time with the awkward base running but yeah last wednesday i wrote an article at yahoo that was like who do we need to panic about and one of the people was joe musgrove and i wrote i essentially wrote musgrove says he's not hurt there's no way that's not true and then well, boom <laughs> il joe musgrove is hurt hopefully he is not out for very long still a lot of questions for the pitching staff on san diego but i think they're going to score a lot of runs the twins over the red Sox. they also cannot complete the sweep their winning streak ends at 12 12 wins in a row though is again yeah there's six it's six teams six teams that i'm about to tell you have never won 12 games in a row the, Rockies, the Marlins are definitely on this list. The Rockies, the Marlins, the Angels, the Mets have never won 12 games in a row. <laughs> the Blue Jays and the Nationals. So obviously some expansion teams in there, you know, some new, newer franchises. But yes, the Mets, Blue Jays have never won 12 games in a row. The Twins did it. They lose on Sunday. But, you know, we got to feel got to feel good about them. Got to feel got to feel good about where Minnesota is at. Uh, having John Duran back is just a delight. I know his closer entrance got a lot of attention over the weekend. And it is deserved because he is he is that he is that guy. Jordan, we now have an unstoppable sausage versus an immovable <laughs> object, which is the rollicking Twins offense against the Mariners pitching staff for yes. a three game set coming up this week, which uh -huh. brings us to our last series. The Seattle Mariners taking two out of three over the Houston Astros at Minute Maid Park. The Astros are now seven games back of the Mariners. They are 10 games. It should be more than that. I mean, to be honest, like seven games for how bad they are. Like, okay, Astros are one and nine in one run games, which is, that's, I mean, okay, sure, there's some bad luck in there, but like, Hater blew another one. So I don't really know what you want. And by the so, way, the game that they won on Friday, the Mariners gave them. Blew it. They just absolutely pooped it away it, and i and at, when they lost that one and i was watching that one on friday i was like oh god here we go like you know well that's being, what i wanted to say yeah it, that game on friday felt like that evil astros snapping their fingers and, and doing their voodoo magic seattle and houston the Mariners. And it was like oh no the, you oh. know this is where it always goes wrong and nope. then logan gilbert comes out on saturday and he's like guys i got you don't worry about SDFU. it you eight scoreless <laughs> eight scoreless and then the mariners win a wild one on sunday cal rally homers off josh hater and uh, yeah, I mean, they just they just looked like the better team. And Houston's uh, offense is having their moments. John Singleton's having some heroics. You know, Jordan, Tucker, whatever. It's not enough because the pitching is just not getting it's just not getting the job done right. Fromber was just not not quite good enough. And uh, you know, the the Mariners have won six straight series. And the Astros, listen, 
that this is the thing. You just don't have that much time. And like the series like this, you, you got to start clawing your way back because this is quite a hole that they have dug themselves. They have the same record as the Angels. That is an amazing sentence to say out loud. May I ask a provocative question? Please. How many Astros games do you think Dusty Baker has watched this year? I mean, how many innings? Very few. Very few. Like so few. Like I don't. Yeah, like just an extremely small number. I mean, isn't he working for the Giants and like not even living? Yeah, yeah there's no way he's he's don't keeping tabs on it. Dusty uh, Baker is not texting his ex. Why would he? No, I mean, he's every time he pulls up, pulls up the standings and you know what he says? That's a shame. <laughs> he's like, oh, no, it's too bad. It's really, sorry, really, really unfortunate. Sorry stuff. about that. <laughs> really, it's unfortunate stuff for them. Hate but that yeah, Mariners, for you. <laughs> Mariners in uh, Mariners in Minnesota will definitely be a nice little, uh, nice little series this week. And then yeah, pitching, pitching just keeps on, keeps on rolling. And Josh Rojas, who is hitting three sixty four forty two five eighty seven for a two hundo OPS plus. I was optimistic about Josh Rojas because he was a very good player for two full seasons before he arrived in Seattle last year and was good for the Mariners last year. But this is, this is absurd. This is ridiculous, but I'm certainly enjoying it. And it has been much needed as JP Crawford has been out for the first place. Seattle Mariners. Jake, it's Willie Mays' 93rd birthday. Let's say happy birthday to Willie. And then we'll say goodbye. Willie Mays. Criminally underrated, which is a wild thing to say for someone who many people believe is the best baseball player of all time. We talk a lot about wins above replacement. Um, uh, Willie Mays has 156 wins above replacement. Point two, sorry. 156. This guy made the All-Star game every year from 1954 until the end of his career in 1973. Most of those years, basically all of them except the last one, were entirely deserved. His lowest OPS plus from 54 to 72 was a 124 OPS plus in 1969. He had more walks than strikeouts every year from 1954 to 1961. His age 40 season is hilarious. He just like at the very end of his career started walking a ton, led baseball in walks and stole 23 bases at the age of 40. His military service, do you know about this? This is a crazy story. Go ahead, go ahead please. So he, he is gets drafted, I believe, or goes to do military service in the Korean War in 1953, misses the whole season in 1953, doesn't end up going to Korea, just kind of does training, base training. And while he's there, he like plays a lot of ball on the army base, which again is hilarious. Could you imagine that now? Like, you know, Mike Trout is just like at the army base crushing normies, whatever. But some outfielder at the army base taught Willie Mays the basket catch, like how wow. to do that. Which and is, then, yeah. The next year, 1954, he's like, watch this. Watch this. <laughs> uh, Willie Mays. What did you learn in the Army? What did the Army teach you? Well, this was my number one the, lesson. How to make you the know, most famous catch right. in the history of the sport. Uh, Willie Mays, you know, debuts, makes his major league debut on May 25th, 1951 in center field. So he plays his first major league game in center field on May 25th, 1951. Plays his last game in center field on July 31st, 1973. <laughs> and uh, it's 22 years between the center field appearances is just delightful. Um, so yeah, Did but, you I mean, know, and then a I whole lot to, of good stuff in between. I need to learn more about this. You know, Willie Mays has four career innings at short. <laughs> in the big leagues? In the big leagues. Uh, Four wow, career innings yeah. at short, five and two-third career innings at third. It looks like, yeah, something was going on in, in 1964 that required <laughs> infielder Willie Mays. And we are going to go learn more about that as soon uh, as we are done more, recording this podcast. Yeah, Two more Willie Mays things. One, listen, did you know, much like Jackson Holiday, Willie Mays started his big league career one for 26? <laughs> Uh, do you think just Jackson a great reminder. is going to hit 600 home runs? Probably not. I don't. But it's just a great reminder. Like, it, it's hard. And when you're a child, it's even right. harder. Willie but, Mays. But here's the difference. Here's the difference. When Willie Mays yeah. went one for 20 or whatever, um, there was no one tweeting about how much he sucks. Yeah. 
Also, his dad wasn't around all the time to <laughs> peer over his shoulder. Uh, Willie Mays as a 17-year-old in the Negro Leagues in 1948. Mm. And this is, you know, at this point, the Negro Leagues is still purring. Like, this is before it kind of gets picked apart by MLB teams. This is at the very, the best players very, out. like, the last, you know, yeah, the last I mean, gasp, but yes. Jackie breaks the barrier in 47, and, like, yeah. the league is, for the most part, still running. Sure. Yeah, like, 48 is still the Negro Leagues. Mm -hmm. I mean, he he's not great as a 17-year-old, but he's, <laughs> like, a like a pretty decent player for a team that I believe yeah. goes to the championships. Like, he's, like, an everyday guy. <laughs> the Birmingham Black Barons as a 17 year old. Yeah. Uh, last yeah. Willie Mays thing. Uh, I live in Harlem. Jordan, I've lived here for six years. And you feel the legacy of Willie Mays at various points in Harlem. There's a street named after him a little bit further north from where I live. And there's a great video I encourage people to watch. Uh, the New York Times put it out a couple years ago uh, about Willie Mays' life in Harlem and how he kind of was very ingrained in the community, how he like lived on the corner of 155th and St. Nicholas and would walk like two blocks to the polo grounds. And every morning he would like play stickball with the kids in the street and then buy them, you know, cream sodas or, you know, egg creams at the, the corner store and then walk to the yard. And, you know, I now coach across the street. So Rucker Park is across the street from where the Polo Grounds used to be. Mm -hmm. And all the motifs of the Polo Grounds housing projects that are there are like black and orange for the Giants. Mm -hmm. There's a plaque that's still there. I encourage anybody who lives in the city who wants to learn more about Willie Mays, take a trip uptown. Go take a look at that plaque. It's very interesting to get a sense for where the Polo Grounds actually was and how how – close it was to Yankee Stadium, right. super underrated right. thing. You could see one from the other across the river. Uh, anyway, happy birthday to Willie Mace, 93 years old. Uh, I am excited to see him at Rickwood. Yeah. Rickwood Field game later this year, which is going to be a celebration of black baseball. Hopefully he gets his way to that event. Uh, thank you all for listening to this Monday edition of Baseball Barbercast. Thank you to Andrew Hartz for producing it. You can email us at baseballbarbacast at gmail.com. That's B A R B cast. And we'll be back on Wednesday talking more. Goodbye.